French bombing, from that moment onwards, for the whole 18th century, Genoa maintained a neutral policy in terms of foreign relationships, with a certain degree of sympathy towards the French side, undoubtedly the biggest and most powerful antagonist in the area. After 1684, it was now clear to the governors that Genoa lacked the means to withstand high intensity threats, such as an open conflict. Therefore, the solution was to increasingly delegate protection to private entrepreneurship, with some differences compared with the previous period. The use to construct armed vessels was rapidly replaced with the widespread adoption, adoption of flags of convenience. As flags of convenience, as I think or you already know, we meant the usage for mentioned vessels to hoist flags which are different from the one of the registered country, to the purpose to obtain special privileges granted to this foreign flag. In the Genoese case, they usually captains hoisted French or British flags in order to be safe from corsairing, due to the fact that these countries had signed bilateral agreements with the Barbary regencies. With flags of convenience, the merchant vessels protected themselves autonomously, with uh, no expenses uh, from the Republic. Meanwhile, however, the state renounced to fiscal impositions to a certain extent, as merchant vessels arrived in ports as foreign and therefore were subjected to different fiscal impositions. This solution is clearly the result of a compromise that occurred in this period between private and public world in Genoa. On the other hand, most of the state efforts were destined to lend safety. In particular, three were the threats and issues which the Republic had to face throughout the 18th century. Firstly, the fate of the Marquisate of, Final, of Finale, which was a sort of a Spanish corridor which cut vertically the Republic's territory. You can see on uh, the, the, the left side of this uh, map. Um, after the Spanish War of Succession, the Habsburgs decided to pass over this land, which, after some negotiations, was finally purchased by the Republic, despite the Savoy Duke had manifested his ambitions in order to gain a maritime projection in the area. Secondly, the Republic had to face, for almost 40 years, an open revolt in Corsica, a revolt that turned out to be a huge drainage of resources for the state, at the point that, after 40 years of conflict, Genoa had to hand over the island to the French. Thirdly, Genoa was uh, engaged again in the engaged in the Assen War of Succession by the Assen themselves, and once again by the Duke of Savoy, who besieged the capital and conquered the city in the in 1746. Afterwards, once freed again, the Republic committed to a serious rethinking of the land fortification system for a new project that was designed then, but completed only in the next century. As to conclude, and, and as to sum up the evolution of the grand strategy of Genoa in the early modern period, I would like to highlight a few crucial points. Already at the end of the Middle Ages, the power policy strategies, as we said, were abandoned. The 1528 connubium with Spain then became instrumental to preserve independence by substantially outsourcing its military engagement to the crown of Spain. Meanwhile, several Genoese private entrepreneurs gained access to the Spanish finance and ascended to the highest military positions. Later on, the Conubium entered into crisis as the result of the diminished influence of Spain on the international scenario. This led to new efforts toward self-protection, as we mentioned. Finally, in the 18th century, as the Republic developed neutral or philo-French positions, maritime safety was delegated mostly to privates through armored merchantmen or flags of convenience, whereas most of the expenses focused on land fortifications and terrestrial war theaters, which and then which were endangering at that point the very independence of the republic i thank you very much and i'll leave the floor to uh, uh, rear admiral domini thank, thank you, you emiliano and leonardo for this deep analysis of this fantastic history of the republic of genova that was one of the great maritime republic of our 
country and really fundamental for the history of, of our Navy. Now is the time to listen Professor Guido Candiani, who will focus on the role of Venice, another maritime city, very important for our medieval and modern history. The title of his speech will be Stato da Mar and Stato da Terra, Venice responses to its new twin sea and land commitments, 16 to 17 centuries. Guido, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Recently, Nicola Rogers asked the authors of the volume edited in the series, The Sea in History, to answer the question, what difference did the sea make? <clears throat> in this conference, the question could be reversed, asking what difference the land made over a naval power. To answer the Venetian case question, we must go back to the first half of the 15th century and to the expansion carried out by the Republic of St. Mark in the mainland. This expansion aimed to prevent the establishment of a strong state that could threaten the existence of the Serenissima. It led to the conquest of the whole territory that stretched from Friuli to Lombardy, from River Isonzo to Adda. Until then, the Samar state had felt safe just maintaining strongholds along the coast from the Adriatic to the Eastern Mediterranean Sea and protecting them with its fleet. The new land policy committed limited Venetian resources not only to the Navy but also to the army. For reconciling these divergent burdens, the Republic sought to find some shared instrument useful for both sea and land war. The shared instrument were mainly three. The first was the adoption of an efficient artillery that could be used indifferently on land and sea. The second was the recruitment of soldiers who should serve on sea and land. The third instrument was the imposition of a double conscription, naval and military, on the terra firma, which would thus have to contribute to the defense of both the Venetian shore and the inland regions, Stato da Mar and Stato da Terra in Venetian vocabularies. About the artillery, Benix experienced an early use of new firearms, which already in the last quarter of the 14th century had an essential role in the naval operation of the War of Chioggia, 1378-81. During the 15th century, the arsenal of Venice specialized in the casting of bronze artillery. The cast bronze guns, in addition to being more effective and safer than the wrought iron once used up to that time, were also lighter and more mobile. In casting bronze artillery, the Republic achieved a high quality, managing to produce guns of considerable power and reliability. In particular, it was a great culverins that constituted the top of the Venetian artillery, used both as a bow guns in galleys and galleasses, in the most sensitive positions of the land fortification. The high quality of Venetian bronze artillery assured a long life for the guns and or the opportunity to recast them efficiently. It favored their use also on the land, above all in the fortress that during the 16th century went to create an articulated defense system either in the Veneto Lombard regions and, uh, of the Stato da Terra and in the coastline possession of the Stato da Mar. The production of bronze artillery was concentrated in the arsenal of Venice, where an entire section was dedicated to casting the guns. This activity was the prerogative of specialists who handed down the art of fusion from generation to generation. The Alberghettis and later the Contis were the two families that had the monopoly of the fusion of the bronze guns in the early modern age. The choice to make the artillery totally interchangeable between land and sea was also reflected in the gun carriages. If the galleys kept a sledge carriage for the main guns, selling warship and possibly galleasses retained until the end of the 17th century a two-wheel carriage similar to that used by the Spaniard of the Invincible Armada. It allowed a rapid transfer of the piece to land. 
with some possible restriction in naval use. Also, the sources never complain about this regard. In the second half of the 17th century, Venice adopted the ship of the line and had to introduce cast iron guns for economies. Their melting was delegated to foundries of the Stato da Terra in regions such as Brescia and Bergamo territories where iron mines were, a sort of venetian wheeled region. Less appreciated than broad guns and less mobile, iron guns found nevertheless wide use in the coastal fortress, where maritime links helped their transport. In this way, they perpetuated the osmosis between sea and land that characterizes the history of Venetian artillery and made it the strong point of the military system of the Republic. The second military element shared between the sea and land was engaging of regular troops that could be used both at sea and on land campaign. The troops most specifically designed for this dual function were the ultramarini, enlisted by Venice in Balkan territories overlooking Adriatic, Ionian, and Aegean Sea, including Ottoman ones. In fact, the ultramarini came from the Venetian territories of Dal Dalmatia and the Levant, and from bordering regions of the Ottoman Empire. More specifically, it was the Albanians and, to a lesser extent, the Greeks who provided a good part of their <coughs> recruits for the companies of Ultramarini, in a game of relation with the Sultan that made the borders between the two states somewhat porous. It must be said that the Ultramarini were not specifically trained for amphibious operations, specialized corps that the Serenissima never had. However, ultramarini were soldiers who knew that they could be sent to serve both at sea and on land, and that they had to accept this dual role at the time of their enlistment. In contrast, the standard infantry men that were often deployed at sea and alongside ultramarini were soldiers originally enlisted for land service. It created tension between the state and men not formally engaged for the demanding employment at sea, especially the companies of Italian infantrymen recruited in other states of the peninsula were considered not very adaptable for the service on the fleet. At sea, Venice preferred to use the so-called ultramontane, essentially German, Swiss, and French. However, they too were not enthusiastic about the service of naval units and much preferred the one in the comfortable garrison of the Venetian Lombard mainland. The problem, rather than training, um, was linked to the specific living condition on board. The tight space made the existence difficult and increased the risk of, of epidemic, while the seasickness was an actual disease that could lead to the death of less adaptable subjects. The need for saving money dictated the excessive use of standard infantry on board. This incidence was asymptotic when the sailing navy was developed during the 17th century. On Venetian sailing warships, the soldiers performed functions that were the re responsibility of the most expensive sailors in other navies. This practice, which grouped the Venetian navy with other navies of Southern Europe, had an ambivalent operational impact. When seasoned, the soldiers performed well on board, but their service was often unforeseeable and hazardous at the, <coughs> at, the <coughs> at the beginning of their sea duty. The third and final component of integration between land and sea was the sea conscription introduced in the Stato da Terra at the beginning of the 16th century. The concept was to use the peasants of the new territories acquired by the Republic to not only, <coughs> not only as army, as army militias, the so-called Cernide, but also as crews to equip the increased number of galleys that expanded the fleet of the Republic. The conscript of the mainland were supposed to provide half of the crews of the 100 galley reserve ready in the arsenal to be armed in case of war. The utmost expression of the mainland sea conscription arose in the War of Cyprus, 1570-73. In the spring of the uh, 1570, the um, territories of Lombardy, Veneto, and Friuli were asked, were asked to provide crews for 45 of the 80 galleys ordered at the, the beginning. The development 
of the conscription is unclear, but it can be assumed it, that uh, the mainland supply more than a third of the crews for 110 new galleys set up in 57. However, this massive <coughs> mobilization of peasants also marked the end of the experience of the <coughs> mainland conscription. The dramatic epidemic that struck the fleet in the second half of the 57th century ruined the crews provided by <coughs> the mainland which were only partly replaced before the Greek battle of Lepanto, Lepanto the year later. The hostility of the population for the conscription, exasperated by this tragic experience, persuaded the state to not propose massive recruitment in the mainland again. It also clashed with the new economic needs of the Venetian patrician, increasingly involved in agricultural investments. The peasants had to continue to serve in the fields, not to risk their lives for the needs of the Navy. During the following a long war of Crete, 1645-69, some cities of the mainland provided crews for a few galleys, but this men tended to be voluntary. The 16th century experiment of the mainland sea conscription had break down, and with it the attempt to offer a sizable numerical base to the fleet's crews in case of war. Land did not deliver the sea. In conclusion, the Republic of Venice tried to adapt to the new commi commitments created by its terrestrial expansion along three different lines. If the interchangeable employment of artillery can be considered a success on material level, on personal one, the results were are less satisfactory. The ultramarine soldiers gave some proof of themselves. Still, the use of other regular troops was ambivalent and linked to the contingent ability and willingness of the listed men, which made their employment not homogeneous and reliable. Negative can finally be considered the experiment of the mainland sea conscription, which was rapidly deserted after the War of Cyprus. In contrast, it remained in force for its land component, the Cernide, until almost the end of the Republic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guido. Uh, Guido is perfectly at home in this marvelous arsenal, being one of the, the most important historians regarding the Venetian history. So I'm very pleased to have listened to your job. It's now time to, to listen a young Doctor Stefano Garcia, his performance uh, will be on one of the most difficult and interesting history moments in our uh, naval history, especially the, the history of our Navy. Uh, exactly at the end of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century. The title of his speech is Caught Between Two Fleets. The Italian Navy through Navalist and Continentalist Perspective in Liberal Italy, 1890-1910. Stefano, the floor is yours. Thank you, Roberto. In the last decade of the 19th century, while the great maritime powers of Europe were gradually executing their ambitious naval and land rearmament programs, the Regia Marina and the Regia Sercito in Italy, we're going through a phase of stalemate and uncertainty, a phase that was primarily due to the country's economic difficulties. The financial year 1889-1890 had in fact closed with a deficit of 220 million lira in a context of generalized fiscal crisis for the public administration, which resulted in the need to increase taxes and to cut the military expenditure. For the Ministry of War, the budget fell to 225 million lira in 1895, its lowest in the decade and 6% less than what it was a few years earlier. Despite a slight increase in the following years, the expenditure for the army remained at an average of 284 million lira until 1904, and then grew up to 394 million lira in 1909. The trend for the Ministry of the Navy was similar. In fact, uh, the budget decreased to 92 
a million lira in um, the first decade, in the last decade of the 19th century, with a sharp drop of more than 10, than 10 points compared to 1890 numbers. Then it settled in the range between 120 and 140 million lira until 1905, uh, 1905 and reached 180 million per year at the end of the decade. Although it is fair to conclude that the armed forces together successfully managed to contain the cut of expenditure in the 1890s, despite the nation's economic troubles, it should however be noted that at the turn of the century, the distribution of new resources remained modest, and thus it became a battleground between navalists and continentalists. The debate from a strategic and ideological perspective focused primarily on Italy's role in the Mediterranean Sea and on defense of Italian borders. Aside from protecting the frontier of the Alps, a growing number of officers, publicists, and politicians were calling for a large-scale naval policy and construction program, while emphasizing the um, unquestionable shortcomings of the Navy, now portrayed as incapable of, of fulfilling its main duty, the defense of Italian coast. In a pamphlet published in 1893, it was an army officer such as Cristoforo Manfredi who pointed out the vulnerability of shores and coastal cities and the need to protect them by reallocating funds from the Ministry of War if necessary. The scare of coastal bombardments and the threat of an enemy landing in the heart of the pen peninsula were among the most frequent arguments used by Italian navali navalists to rally public opinion to their side and thereby to gain political support. These arguments included the following claims. The Regia Marina had to protect the merchant navy and national maritime traffics, both inside and outside the Mediterranean Sea. The Regia Marina had to promote Italian expansionism and to safeguard its colonial interests. Interest. The Regia Marina was meant to be a tool for driving the country's industrial development. These ideas were uh, revised by Camillo Manfroni, Augusto Vittorio Vecchi, and Domenico Bonamico. The latter, in a series of articles published at the end of the century, redefined the Italian maritime problem and acknowledged that the existing naval forces were insufficient to protect the borders from a French attack, and thus, it was essential, given the tight budget constraints, to rethink the balance of military expenditure in favor of the Navy. This thesis, thesis was widely accepted by the most intransigent navalists, and was the general idea, as was the general idea of not subordinating uh, the um, request of the Navy to budgetary requirements, even though there were different positions within the movement on the issue of what strategy was to be pursued, or what, or what type of ships were to be built in order to achieve the sea control, or on how the Armada was to be deployed or to be an instrument of foreign policy. On the opposite side, the Continentalists advocated a defensive naval strategy in which the priority of the Italian Navy would have been to assist the army, and therefore they considered large battleships to be unnecessary and expensive. The fight between continentalists and navalists was worsened by the funding of the Lega Navale Italiana, Italian Navy League, in mid-1897. Uh, the Italian Navy League held together a heterogeneous movement made up of serving naval, naval officers, editors working for national periodicals, and members of parliament, who tried to carry out in Italy the task of vulgarizing naval issues and to bring navalist ideas and ideology to the general public uh, to the general voting public in that context while it proved to be difficult to reach uh, um, an animal uh, agreement on uh, an italian maritime grant strategy all members agreed in advocating for larger scale budget for the navy even if such objective required a cut of armix expenditure at first. At the same time, many navalists pointed to the slowness of Italian naval construction, as compared to that of the other great powers, to the poor organization of the state arsenals, and in certain cases, 
they blame the ministry for having made the fleet a sample of different and non-homogeneous warships. Moreover, the ministry was weakened by the failure to reach the objectives set up by the 10-year level law of, 90, of 1887. Since, as the deadline approached, several, several capital ships and a large number of torpedo boats um, were missing due to budget cuts. These were some of the contradictions in which, as we shall see, the Italian left found the soft underbelly where militarism could be it. From a technical point of view, however, the querelle over the design of new warship orbited around two main points. On the one hand, there was great concern among navalists and officers about the quality of torpedo boats in Italy, as the Italian fleet could rely on ships capable of an, av on an average speed of only 20 knots, while new torpedo boats and destroyers built abroad were now capable of a speed up to 30 knots. But the most controversial question in uh, controversial topic in shipbuilding in Italy, as elsewhere, um, was about the technical characteristics of the first and second class battleships. Until the launch of the HMS Dreadnought and the subsequent design of the Italian Dante Ligieri, different solutions were implemented to find a satisfying compromise between armament and protection. The result was that newly built classes of battleship differed in number, arrangement, and caliber of artillery, in type and level of protection, and in maximum speed design limits, raising fears among navalists and experts about the deployment in a worst case scenario. The situation was slightly better for cruisers though, as within the Ministry of the Navy, attention was quickly turned to the development of armored cruisers, mostly preferred to protect the ones leading to the creation of the excellent Pisa and San Giorgio classes, as well as the Garibaldi. However, while navalists were clamoring for new constructions, continentalists wanted a fleet mainly composed of modern torpedo boats for the protection of coastline and ports. Towards the end of the century, the fight between continentalists and navalists also flared up in the parliamentary walls especially during the discussions of law, um, laws and budget estimates of the two armed forces. Since the confrontation between the two military staffs could only lead, have led to an impasse, its resolution had to be a political one, based on uh, an evaluation of available funds and national strategic goals. The clash escalated in May 18, 1897 from a long speech by the member of parliament Fortunato, who, in discussing a law for the Regio Sercito, formally asked the government not to make the Navy budget a mere fund for industrial interest. If, make the, if the Navy, um, if Italy could not afford the luxury of possessing both a large army and a large fleet, he assumed that it was necessary to assert its position as a great naval power due to its historical legacy and the geographical position uh, of the peninsula. Mm, a similar thought was shared by Colombo, former minister of the treasury and Biscaretti, according to whom it was always Italy's geography that, has, that suggests why priority in allocation of military expenditure was to be given to the navy rather than to the army. They both also drew attention to the material and, above all, moral consequences caused um, by a naval bombardment of coastal cities that could throw the country into panic and jeopardize the resilience in the event of the nation in the event of a conflict, uh, an eventuality that was considered far from unlikely. The navalist narrative uh, relied on some elements which made the Navy essential for the nation. And there were the protection of national prestige abroad, the protection of emigrants, the protection of the law of nations or the international role of Italy, and the colonial expansion. There were also politicians who lined up with pro-Navy perspective only for anti-continentalist purposes, such as the Sicilian Colleyanni, for whom the ethical values of the military apparatus had to be questioned. 
since the army was too often used as an involuntary instrument of capitalist oppression um, to repress popular and workers' unrest. Colayani, just stuck position of Regia Marina and Regia Sercito revealed a peculiar vision where the quintessence of the fleet was linked to the expansion of maritime traffic and not solely to militarize the society and to maintain public order, unlike the army. The pro-navalist bloc was opposed by those who, like the um, right-wing uh, member of the parliament, Morigi, reacted the idea that the national defense could be achieved at sea. And those who, like the war minister Pelou himself, ruled out and engaged any changes in the balance of the expenditure between the armed forces. Where the controversy between navalist and continentalist continued, in 1899, a new subcommittee for the naval budget was formed. And when draft of the report signed by Carlo Randaccio leaked out in May, the national press bluntly stated that the condition of the Navy, and in particular of its administration, were no less than dramatic. The left-wing periodicals, which had already given some space uh, to Randaccio in the previous months, um, were the first to give wide coverage to the leaked indiscretions. Even though the alarming tones used in the document were spreading to all national and local newspapers, regardless of any political orientation. According to the report, um, Italy had failed to keep up with its rival naval powers, with several antiquated warships of various types and service, while other fleets had equipped themselves with modern units. And the chaos of this backwardness was to be found in the, in the mismanagement of Navy's budget, since the central administration had not tried to reduce any of the parasitic needs the thin the funds allocated to the modernization, modernization of the fleet. The report seemed to pave the way for those navalists who were calling for a process of renewal in the administration of the Navy and for a major program of naval constructions. But it also provided the first weapons for the forthcoming anti-navalist campaign carried out by the Italian Socialist Party. Between 1901 and 1908, in fact, the Socialist Party turned into the main political and public opponent of the navalist, navalist, for whom it, gave, it became imperative to raise public awareness against the so-called left-wing misrepresentations. On closer inspection, however, socialist anti-militarism was not so radical to ex as to exclude spending on the Navy outright. Silvia Viviani, who was the most prominent expert on military matters among socialists, justified the existence of the, Navy, of the naval institution in a series of seven articles published in Critica Sociale. At the same time, however, he criticized the obsession with uh, um, imaginary enemy landings from the sea and their use in support of an expansionist policy. Viviani's assessment was analyzed and questioned by Augusto Vittorio Vecchi in a long article published in Revista Nautica, where he challenged the Socialist Party in terms of naval reform, proposing alternatives that did not call into question the prestige nor the economic resources of the Armata. Tensions intensified in 1903, as the um, Socialist Party minister experience drew to a close. Um, in the end, the anti-navalist campaign became one of the pillars of the socialist information and involved the entire national press. And in the short term, the anti-navalist campaign made by Ferry uh, made Ferry exception, exceptionally popular, thereby threatening the um, Socialist Party, and forced the government to establish a parliamentary commission of inquiry into the condition of the Navy. Anyway, uh, after this crisis, the navalist movement on the wall emerged from this um, three-year period more cohesive and shortly afterwards uh, obtained the launched for increase in military expenditure. Its growth was obviously made possible by the improvement of the country economic conditions. Uh, nonetheless, and paradoxically, its growth was also made possible by anti-navalist propaganda. In an article written in May 1999, the socialist leader Turat himself acknowledged that a socialist campaign against the Navy had ultimately helped to justify the request of new funds for shipbuilding, as it had convinced 
both the establishment and the public opinion that better warships were actually needed. In doing so, moreover, any disagreement between navalists and continentalists had faded into the background. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefano. <clears throat> you did a great job. And uh, now I'm very pleased to introduce as uh, last lecturer, Professor Francesco Zampieri. We have uh, a, a very old uh, friendship started in 1993 when he was a young student and uh, we grow up together in, in our common passion. His great love for the Navy was a constant in his life and I am very happy to introduce him on the subject of tonight that is between land and sea, remarks on the Italian Navy during the Cold War and the early 21st century. Francesco, the floor is yours. Thank you to Rear Admiral Roberto Domini and to Professor uh, Fabio De Nino for the invitation and for the kind introduction. I'm very honored to be virtually connected with the US Naval Academy, and I hope to give an interesting uh, contribution to the McMullen Naval Historical Symposium. Uh, with my speech, uh, we have the problems with the, the presentation. Okay. No problem. Uh, with uh, my speech, uh, I will analyze uh, the progressive enlargement of the operational theater for the Italian Navy, Marina Militare, in the geostrategic space named Enlarged Mediterranean. The last but not least, I will explain the possible evolution of this geostrategic uh, vision. During the Cold War, the Mediterranean, a geopolitical concept covering part of the Middle East, was a place of rivalry between United States and Soviet Union. After this assumption, it is important to indicate the main partitions of the Cold War in the Mediterranean. In the 50s, the Mediterranean became an American lake. In the 60s, it was a scenario for USA and Soviet Union confrontation. In the 70s, the Mediterranean experienced the global and the regional detente between the superpower. The Mediterranean experienced also a sort of geostrategic autonomy represented by the European integration and the political and economic changes in the southern and eastern countries. During the entire Cold War, the Mediterranean was the southern flank of the Western Bloc against the Soviet Union. In the American strategic view, the southern and northern flanks were always the wings of the central fortress, the most important front line during the Cold War. The American strategic perspective imposed, firstly, to bottle the Soviets in the Black Sea and to avoid them to access to the Red Sea. Secondly, to secure ready access to Middle Eastern oil, essential for the Western European economy, and thirdly, to sustain Israel in the struggle with the Arabian countries. At the beginning of the Cold War, the main threat against Italy was perceived by land through the Gorizia's door. It uh, could have been the possible main hassles for the land forces of communist states. So, the main mission of the Italian Navy was uh, the support to the Italian army and the defense of Adriatic. Until 1949, the Navy was focused on a regional war scenario with the maximum of force engaged in the Adriatic Sea, firstly in the Otranto Channel, and secondly in the Central and Upper Adriatic. Despite the Navy's commitment, the defense of Northeastern Frontier, or border, was always managed by the Italian army with the aid of the Italian Air Force. In the view of army and Air Force, military Italia, the Italian Navy was a Cinderella of the national military capabilities, and this view pushed the military expenditures in favor of the army and the Air Force. In the 50s, the Italian Navy changed its tasks. 
the main missions was still the defense of Adriatic coast and the cooperation with the army and the air force. But the Navy rediscovered its nature of Mediterranean Navy. So the most important mission was the protection of sea line of communication. In case of war, Italy would require 40 million tons of haves carried by 3,500 ships per year. In the central Mediterranean, the escort of United States carrier vessel battle group was another mission for the Marina Militare. So the central Mediterranean became the main operational theater until mid 70s. The emphasis on the central Mediterranean required new investments and the Navy acquired new ships and helicopters to, to perform its new tasks. The Navy selected technologically advanced weapon systems and Italian made components. The 70s viewed the renewal of the Soviet challenges in the Mediterranean due to the friendship with the Arabian countries. After the Yom Kippur War, the Italian Navy put attention also into the proliferation of anti-ship missiles and missile fast attack crafts. At the same time, the increase of the claims for the exploitation of maritime natural resources by the Arabian countries was an alarm for the Italian policy in the Mediterranean Sea. To perform the missions in a more challenging operational theater, the parliament voted the naval law of 1975. New tasks for the Navy were defined. Firstly, an increased attention to national interest in the Mediterranean area. Secondly, an increase of the Navy's capabilities to protect Mediterranean sea, lack of, sea line of communication beyond the geographic Mediterranean. To ensure these missions, the Navy required new warships and equipments. An helicopter carrier, the future through deck cruiser Giuseppe Garibaldi, and new escort ships. The naval law of 1975 was one of the two axes inspiring the Italian Navy in the 80s and 90s. The other axis was a, na a new strategic concept identifying in the vision of the enlarged Mediterranean the main operational theater for the Navy. The strategic concept was born in the 80s at Naval War College, then hosted in Legon at the Naval Academy. While respecting the NATO's strategic area of interest, the idea of enlarged Mediterranean claimed a space for a national action coinciding with the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea, but also through the Red Sea with the Persian Gulf. The new concept of enlarged Mediterranean was progressively adopted by all Italian armed forces and by political class. By the beginning of the 80s, all the Italian mission, military missions were coherent with the enlarged Mediterranean vision, and the Italian Navy became the main tool of the Italian government for a proactive policy. The first display of the new strategic posture defined by the enlarged Mediterranean theory were the missions in Lebanon, 1982 and 1984, the first peacekeeping operations for the Italian Armed Forces. In 1982, the Italian Navy gave also naval assets to the UN multinational force and observer mission in the Gulf of Tiran, devoted to assure the freedom of navigation in favor of Israeli port of Eilat. In 1984, after the discovery of mines in the Red Sea, the Italian Navy performed a new mission in the Red Sea and the Bab el-Mandeb Strait. These missions were the first outside the Mediterranean, but inside the enlarged Mediterranean. The Italian involvement was justified by the strategic role of the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. For the Italian economy, in 1983, 15% of Italian import and 33% of the oil passed through the Suez Canal. Already then, Italy was a country with an economy strongly dependent by the freedom of the seas. The most challenging mission of 80s was the escort to merchant vessels in the Persian Gulf 
between September 1987 and December 1988. This mission was conducted with the new warships of the naval law of 1975. The Persian Gulf War was a new commitment for the Italian Navy in the beginning of 90s. This mission shifted the Italian Navy to a new operational profile. The Italian Navy sent destroyers, frigates, auxiliary ships, and mine hunters. The destroyer Audace was shifted under the Allied, under the Allied command and joined the US Roosevelt Cardiac Vassal Battle Group. The Gulf War confirmed the quality of the Italian Navy and of its ships, but also demonstrated the opportunity to accelerate the implementation of a naval aviation with fixed wing assets. The law of February 1989 authorized the acquisition of fixed wing aircraft for the Marina Militare. Italy chose the American version of Harrier and a strict cooperation with the US Navy and Marine Corps. The decision to acquire the American Harriers empowered the link between the US forces and the Marina Militare. This decision made possible a strict interoperability and it would prove invaluable in the military operation of the 21st century. Uh, the end of the international stability assured by Cold War bipolarism gave space to civil war in the, some countries of the Third World. The 90s began with Somalia's crisis generated by the collapse of the Somali state and by the subsequent civil war. The Somalia is located inside the strategic theater of the enlarged Mediterranean, and naturally, the Italian Navy became the main asset for the national involvement. Between 1992 and 1995, the Marina Militare operated off Horn of Africa and on land. During the deployments in Somalia, the Italian Navy assured the missions of power projection ashore with its amphibious forces, the Regimento San Marco, and missions of maritime interdiction and escort. After the 9-11 tragedy, Italy very quickly joined the US allies because the attack against the United States was perceived as an attack against the West. Uh, an Italian task group composed by the aircraft carrier Giuseppe Garibaldi and two frigates steamed to the Indian Ocean. The frigates performed leadership interdiction operations and maritime interdiction operations. The Giuseppe Garibaldi operated with eight Harriers armed with laser guided bombs and the very efficient lightning targeting pod. The availability of the lightning pod was a game changer because the Italian aircrafts were able to operate in support of the American bombers targeting enemy forces. The common training language and procedures of the Italian and US naval aviators made the cooperation among allies very quick and complete. After the enduring freedom operation, the Italian Navy was engaged in the anti-piracy missions off Somali coasts. The Leonte operation in Lebanon was another important commitment for the Italian Navy. In the Leonte, the Navy's power projection capabilities were fundamental. The Giuseppe Garibaldi and the LPDs San Giorgio class deployed and supported the Italian contingent. The Italian Navy assured also the command and control of the maritime interdiction operation performed by the task force uh, conducted, uh, the task force, sorry, 425, conducted by the British, French, and Greek navies. The last and the most challenging mission of the first decade of the 21st century was the Operation Unified Protector, the military intervention against Gaddafi's regime in 2011. The availability of the aircraft carrier and the naval aviation was a real game changer for the bombing missions. The aircraft carrier Giuseppe Garibaldi was deployed off the Libyan coast and this action made more cheap and more efficient the employment of the naval aviation than the missions of the land-based aircrafts. The naval areas perform the 62% of the recognition missions and the 
53% of the attack emissions completed by Italian aircrafts. I hope that my PowerPoint presentation has achieved to explain the progressive enlargement of the Italian geostrategic space and the operational area of the Marina, of the Marina Militare. From the beginning of the 80s, the enlarged Mediterranean has progressively expanded, expanded and the Italian Navy affirmed its capability to operate in a wider geopolitical and geostrategic space. Nowadays, the enlarged Mediterranean is characterized by the growth of the military capabilities of some Middle Eastern powers like Turkey and Northern, uh, Northern Africa powers, Egypt, Algeria, Morocco, interesting in enlarging their geostrategic space and to revise the principles of the law of the seas. At the same time, the instability of some failed states, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, and Libya, represents a crucible of illegal migrations, instability, terrorism, and an occasion for the status seeker powers like Russia and China. Italy, as a part of NATO, must assure the stability in the Euro Mediterranean region and beyond. The enlarged Mediterranean of today is still a vital space for Italy. The defense and the protection of this strategic space requires the capability to act at the key access of the enlarged Mediterranean, the Suez Canal, the Strait of Bab el Mandeb, the Strait of Hormuz at the east, and the western coasts of Africa in the west. Nowadays, in the enlarged Mediterranean, is connected with the Pacific Ocean and linked to the Indo-Pacific region. As declared by the Italian Chief of Naval Operations, in a near future, the Navy maybe will be called to operate in the Arctic region or in the Indo-Pacific region or in the South China Sea as a part of a NATO's or European task group. Wherever will be the limits of the enlarged Mediterranean, I'm sure that the Marina Militare will perform its mission with the skills demonstrated in the past. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Francesco, for, for your deep analysis uh, regarding the life of our Navy since the 50s in what we call the Cold War, a, a time that we, we live on board and, and we remember uh, for the deep job, very important job we did. After Francis Francesco, uh, as a last uh, lecturer, we have Professor Fabio De Nino. He will conclude our panel as discussion. His lecture will encompass the prompt and the ideas as discussed before. Thanks, Fabio. The floor is yours. Thank you. Before starting, I would like to express my thanks to Rear Admiral Domini and the Chesmar for the organization of this panel in Venice, the Marina Militare and the Italian Naval Staff College for hosting us, with a special mention for the Chief of the Institute, Rear Admiral Andrea Romani, and Captain Spolauer for providing all logistical support, being very patient with us. And also thanks to our sponsors, Fincantieri and Banca di Credito Cooperativo Prealpi San Biagio for their support. Finally, I would also like to express my thanks to the symposium organizers because you did a great job in these hard times. Now, the idea of this panel was born from the growing body of research concerning the relationship between the dominant sea power and the ascending continental states. The interest, of course, is related to the current rise of China as a continental challenger to the naval hegemony of the United States. Much of the current historiographical attention seems devoted to the continental states that build large naval forces capable of posing a severe challenge to the existing naval hegemon, Imperial Germany and the Soviet Union. This is understandable due to the current shift in international relations. However, it is also true that the current maritime balance is shifting toward a multipolar system. The rise of a competitor to the hegemon often is accompanied by the rise of other larger continental navies, leading to a renewed maritime and naval competition among themselves, 
the challenge, the continental challenger of the status quo and the hegemon itself. Multipolarity accelerates my time in naval competition in the international system, showing the importance of medium and small, smaller navies of continental states for the global naval balance of power. For example, the Kiel Center on Sea Power Studies devoted some attention to this subject, analyzing small navies and their flexibility in moving between alliance roles and national security. Now, the papers presented in the history of the Italian naval powers, I think, embraced a good part of these historiographical developments. That is why we thought that our panel could have been of interest not only to scholars interested in Mediterranean naval history, but also to a wider audience. The four studies discussed a variety of diversified problems due to their nature. Genoa was a small sea state, Venice a sea power state, Liberal Italy a continental state with overseas colonial and territorial ambitions, but also a country dependent on maritime trade for survival. Republican Italy was a medium power building a navy from scratch, operating under the patronage of a superpower. Nevertheless, all these cases have two critical questions in common. A relative scarcity of resources for naval development caused by the influence of land commitments and operating in a multipolar, in a multipolar context facing more resourceful opponents. The impact of staying between Europe and the sea is clear in Guido's paper about Venice. The city was one of the sea power states identified by Andrew Lambert, and Guido's paper eventually shows the ambiguities for a sea power state to have a relatively sizable territorial base that was in the end too small to shift the odds in its favor. The continental base allowed Venice to access a workforce and a more extensive manufacturing base than the city had, and both were relevant elements to maintain Venetian naval power in the 60th and 70th centuries being necessary to expand the fleet recruitment pool and introducing new dual use technologies for the deployment of both on land and sea. As we have seen, the results were mixed. The Republic's capability to extract these resources clashed with the growing involvement of the city wealthy elites in agricultural investment and workforce employment in farming. As we know, a, sizable, a sufficiently sizable maritime population is one of the critical constituents of sea power, according to both classical naval thinkers and contemporary maritime strategists. I think that Guido's paper clearly remarks the, on the importance of this aspect. In that sense, it seems that we can argue that land made a, made a negative difference here. As we know, Always Lambert uh, sustains that shifting in land changed the, maritime, the Venetian maritime identity, proving critical for the decline of the Venetian sea power states more than commitments against the Ottoman friends and the Habsburgs. But I would like, if this is a, a true in Guido's opinion, the turning inland of Venetian identity was the premise or the consequence of the Venetian sea power state decline, or they were eventually symbiotic process. Turning toward land also seems the conclusion of the long-term development of the Genoese naval history. The key factors were the decline of Genoa's patron, the Spanish Empire, and the rise of an existential threat to the Republic's survival due to the rise of Savoy. Sea power is a slow-acting acting element of warfare and cannot save a country from an, an army pressing at its own frontiers. And Jonas' experience show the inner end limits for small continental states of developing a maritime trade network without the continuing security provided by a great power backing. Genoa battled on Spanish land and naval power, and the city used its diplomatic and financial powers as a force multiplier to deter and fight France, the Ottomans, while securing its trade networks in the Western Mediterranean and the Atlantic. Naval deterrence and diplomacy worked on pair to secure economic prosperity until Spain could guarantee its protection. Dependence from diplomacy and cooperation shown by Genoa case seems familiar to small maritime trading nation. We can find similar examples today in the post-Cold War era. Singapore, for example, developed a naval policy based on a combination of deterrence, trade defense, and security relations based on cooperation, with an increasingly shifting toward the naval hegemon as the instability of the South China Sea is increased. Emiliano and Leonardo's paper shows the importance of a symbiotic relationship between a sea state and a great patron 
to secure the maritime success of both. It also shows the risk of dependence when the Patreon cannot back anymore your security. So my question for them, if we have time, is what stopped Genoa from searching another maritime Patreon eventually? If small powers tend toward integration, medium powers can improve their position and eventually gain more significant influence and independence within an alliance system. The case of the Italian Navy, Repu the Italian Republic Navy Marina Militare offers some fascinating insights into the relationship between a client state, the hegemon, and the process of alliance building. After the Second World War, the three major European continental powers, Germany, France, and Italy, had nearly ceased to exist. French and Italian navies both aspired to recuperate their role, influence, and possibility independence within the context of NATO. So despite a relative delay in technological development, in the French case, an independent naval policy was achieved by the 1960s, and success was the consequence of French political elites in, uh, in interest in having a relatively flexible instrument for their foreign policy. On the contrary, Italian foreign policy was more strictly aligned to the United States and NATO, mainly due to the political and economic weakness of the young Italian Republic. Now, Francesco remembered the early attempts in the 1950s of the Italian uh, diplomacy to gain a space of action in the Middle East and Mediterranean, but the effects of, of these uh, attempted expansions should not be exaggerated. Because Italian naval policy in the 1950s remained more confined within the framework of NATO needs, centered on Central European commitments to land and their power. The continental commitments of the alliance, more than inter-service rivalry, I think, keep the Navy as a Cinderella, despite the Marina Militare desire for a larger fleet. Meanwhile, Access to American and NATO patronage allowed the rapid technological improvements and the introduction of higher training of standards, remaining some of the shortcomings emerged during the Second World War. As a result, contrary to the technological backwardness of the fascist era, the Cold War weapon system of the Italian Navy were an excellent example of a medium-sized naval power capable of producing innovative incremental technologies with limited financial resources. On the contrary, access to cutting-edge nuclear technology, which were also desired, for example, by the Italian Navy, were remained bound to the naval hegemon will to supply them. Italian uh, um, statesmen and eventually the leaders of the Italian Navy uh, wanted to build a nuclear-capable Navy that could have marked a shift in the Italian international position. However, securing these results only with the Italian economic and scientific resources was nearly impossible. Italian attempts to gain American support also clashed with Washington's desire to maintain a centralized control of the nuclear weapons and, and nuclear war planning, remarking the limits of subordination to an hegemon power. Also, again, as Francesco pointed out, during the 1970s, this scenario changed. The tent and the rising military threats from the southern shore of the Mediterranean partially diminished the previous continent, continental commitments of the Italian armed forces. The Navy law of 1975 designed a new fleet. The new strategic concept of the enlarged Mediterranean pushed the Italian commitments far from continental Europe. Nevertheless, the prevailing continentalism of the Italian elites and the reduction of military spending after the Cold War ended in frustrating the desires for a larger fleet. As a result, the Marina Militare invested in the flexibility of its instrument through technological concentration and innovative designs. The choice allowed it to maintain more significant power projection capacity than financial resources alone eventually could provide. And I think that, again, this could testify the tendency toward incremental innovation of medium-sized navies. Eventually, Francesco can tell much more on that subject because it's something that he's currently studying. Also, financial restraints were a constant for all four cases uh, analyzed. And Stefano's paper is the one that links better the budgetary problem around the conflicting continental and strategic maritime Italian identities. Overcoming the predominant capitalist mentality in Italian political elites required two parallel steps. The first was the political pressure by the naval industrial complex and the definition of a clear mission for the Italian Navy in support of national expansion during the age of imperialism. 
Both pillars were bound to specific historical, political, and economic conditions, and indeed similar developments happened in no significant continental sea powers during that year. We know that at that time, a burst of maritime and naval competition characterized the age of navalism, allowing continental states to develop their naval doctrines in response to peculiar strategic conditions. Now, doctrine is probably an, an element that could have been better underlined in this panel, being vital to understanding in general, more in general naval development. And I think that the four cases of the Italian navies that we have analyzed are an invitation to reflect on the fact that strategic cultures and doctrines of sea power could not be analyzed only in the framework of, of the Anglo-American dictonomy, Mahan Kobet, or the naval thinking of the Edgeman challengers like Tirpitz and Gorshoff, as often happens in the current studies. Instead, their analysis must be more bounded to specific situation of the countries analyzed. French historiography, for example, in particular the work of Hervé Cotopagheri, probably called this aspect better than uh, Anglo-American studies. And I think that the study of Italian naval history, and probably more in general the study of medium-sized continental sea powers, must to pay greater attention to their peculiarities. Now, returning to the general question, as we know, Lambert identified as a key limit of a continental state's naval development, the peripheral importance of sea or the substitution of the sea with land as their economic and security cornerstone. This in the end changed their culture and led to the failure of their uh, of maritime states. However, the construction of the Italian navies resulted from a constant tension between continentalism and the relatively strong maritime tradition. Often the first prevailed, even if the economic structure of the Italian states depended nearly totally on maritime trade. Italian states secured their prosperity when they matched the dependency from sea uh, with their naval policy and were defeated when they renounced to use the sea to sustain their economy, for example, as fascist Italy did during the Second World War. This mismatch opened a question. Is there a cultural problem in Italian history in identifying the connection between maritime security and economic needs? And again, this is a problem of strategic culture. Now, this is, uh, these are two questions I would like to leave open for the future debate of Italian naval history. Thank you for listening to my comments. And I'll give you to Admiral Roberto Domi the floor. Thank you, Fabio, for your interesting view. We are at the end of, of our panel, and I would like to point out some, some aspects. The first one, we look uh, uh, to an important part of, of our naval history from the 14th uh, century to, to the 20th century. We move on uh, the Republic, the famous Maritime Republic, Genoa and Venice, as a starting point of our naval tradition. It's a domination that, uh, uh, as domination I mean the tradition is totally involved in, in our past. So we need uh, to, to check and, and not lose this capability and, and this memory. If we lose the memory is really, uh, I would say, stupid for us because we, we need the tradition and we need the memory to do better in the future. And I am very pleased that uh, today we, this McMullen Symposium, we, we did exactly this. We did a job trying to find out in our past some good aspect and some good point to follow up. I don't know if we have questions uh, from uh, the public. If uh, no question arise, I will uh, expert. Gentlemen, we have one question for you here. Uh, can you stand up and say it? Thank you. That's perfect. Yeah, the owl can be on. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Prima cosa vuole dire, io sono, sono, un mes, sono un medico del sesto americano, ma quindi sono un studente di italiano, mi piace tantissimo il tuo paese. Ma allora farò la domanda in inglese. I have a question for, for Dr. Gracia. Uh, he was talking about 
the budgetary constraints in building up the Navy in the 1890s and early 1900s. And I was thinking, that was shortly after the unification of Italy. And I was wondering to what extent uh, the, the struggles to unify and make, and make a, a republic out of uh, you know, multiple city states uh, uh, contributed to the tension in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, assigning funds for the buildup of the Navy. If that was something that was a factor of were relevant in these financial struggles. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, actually, to be honest, I had to hurry up at the end of the of my talk, so I couldn't really explain some of the elements that uh, interfere and influence the um, uh, the contrast between continentalist vision and then navalist vision. Um, about the budgetary constraints, uh, they for sure add a um, relevant role. And we can see that there is a different trend between the last decade of the 19th century and the first decade of the um, 20th century. Um, the, the point, the main point is probably that um, we have uh, limited budget and the question was how to use it in the best possible way um, the navy basically had enough resources to um, move with this uh, uh, process of modernize the the fleet but um, as the report made by uh, carlo randaccio uh, made clear uh, there was a Miss um, a non functioning system in uh, the central administration of the fleet. There were a lot of resources that were shared by some services that were basically useless for the uh, reproduction, reproduction of the um, of the warships, and which was basically the, the main point, the main topic discussed by navalists and continentalists in their pamphlets, in their uh, uh, articles in the journals and periodicals. And in the end, uh, there was a struggle because um, the, mm, the central administration didn't want to realize that the resources could be spent in a better way. And they kept uh, um, wasting those resources because, uh, for example, I often encountered cases of uh, very expensive doors placed in our warships. And the Minister of the Navy sometimes uh, had to personally inquire about these doors. It's just an example, for instance, but uh, it really makes clear how these resources were wasted uh, because there were. Um, it was absurd. They were wasted. They were a waste of resources, and uh, still, there was. Um, it was like there was no way to fix those issues. And even when uh, the budget was um, uh, when it was bigger in the first decade of the new century, uh, these problems still persist. And socialism. And the socialist uh, um, anti navalist campaign tried to um, give possible solution for these problems that were passing from uh, the changing of the leadership or in the establishment of the Regio Marina, which was obviously not possible. Um, but what's most interesting um, from a point of view is that the socialist propaganda made possible um, an improvement in the resources that the Navy had from the from 1905, more or less. And that's my point of view, basically. I'm um, not sure if you want to uh, know something else about the, the topic, or that's fine. I, I was 
I was coming here while you were talking, so perhaps I missed something about your question. But please tell me if that's the case. Uh, no, I, uh, I, th I think that you answered my question. I, I did not realize that uh, you, you know, you addressed it because I, I was not aware that there was such. I, although I did think that there would be a, a difficulty with central administration and central administration of the funds, given that, that the country had unified so recently uh, before the time period that you talked about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you also for your Italian. That is fantastic. So this is very, uh, very nice for us to listen somebody aware uh, of uh, of our culture and our language. That is very important. Um, if we are, if we don't have any other question from the United States, possibly we, we can have some question from here, from our and also from. Uh, people connected with the internet. Absolutely. Maybe one, maybe one question to uh, Dr. Rampieri, who has analyzed the... Do, do I need a mic? To put it aside, maybe enter in a... A short question to Dr. Rampieri. To parlare di fronte alla cosa. Who has analyzed the uh, concept of uh, enlarged Mediterranean uh, concept, which is very, very uh, famous for us. And so we have also analyzed a lot. And uh, uh, do you think uh, there is a possible evolution of, the, of this concept in, in terms of uh, employment of our Navy? Or do we have a limit uh, uh, in terms of uh, the size of our Navy and uh, a, a sort of uh, limit in terms of uh, power projection? Because our Navy is not a nuclear one. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you to Rear Admiral uh, Giuseppe Schivardi for uh, this uh, very interesting question and very, very, very difficult for me to give you an intelligent uh, answer. I, I hope uh, that this is my possibility. Uh, the um, power projection capability is one of the most important um, goals for the Italian Navy. Uh, from the um, 60s to today, and this is very, in my opinion, and in particular, the commitments uh, in the enlarged uh, Mediterranean and beyond the uh, enlarged Mediterranean pushed the politicians and the general naval general staff uh, to develop and to design a new modern fleet uh, with the power projection capability. I want to remember to uh, our... Uh, uh, discussant and uh, our panelists, uh, the project in uh, the early years of the 21st century for a new power projection task group, uh, in particular uh, the task group with the new aircraft carrier Cavour and new LPDs, and in the future a new uh, improved power projection capability with, with the LHD Trieste and F-35 B version uh, for the short takeoff and vertical landing. The power projection capabilities and in particular the availability of an aircraft carrier is one of the pillars of the Navy of today and one of the pillars of the Italian defense, in my opinion. The limit of the conventional propulsion uh, propulsion, sorry, is uh, very important for the surface warships but uh, in the operational area of the enlarged Mediterranean for our submarines, uh, in particular for our air independent propulsion submarines, uh, we haven't limits in uh, the availability of uh, very capable tools for our naval policy. Okay, thank you. So I, I think we have another question from the United States. Gentlemen, the question is for Mr. Brian Chow. I have a speculative, perhaps counterfactual question. Italy's unification as a modern state occurred relatively late, and it was done against an Austria-Hungary coming over Italy's sole land border. Do you think that if Italy had unified earlier, maritimeism would have been more dominant? And the second question is, to what extent 
the continentalism, maritimeism debates in other countries, for example, France, affect both the debate within Italy and Italy's naval posture? Uh, we have difficulties in hearing the question. Can you copy and paste them in the chat so we can read it? Yes. Thank you. That's a from Brian. Okay. This is a question that involves many of us, I think it would be interesting to, to answer because the, the first, which is a, a speculative one, probably involves uh, the paper of uh, Stefano more than uh, anyone else. Uh, I'm an historian, so I have to be honest, I don't like um, to forecast different paths, but we can try an exercise here. The point is, when Italy could have been a unified country before the second half of the 19th century, the only possible moment realistically was during the Napoleonic Wars. But at that time, it could have been only a French satellite state in the end. And so eventually it was going to be conditioned by the strong continental attitude of Napoleonic France. So I don't think that uh, eventually uh, maritimism could have been more dominant. But as I, I'm telling you, this is just speculation. It's hard to preview what would have happened with a different past. The second point, um, Italy uh, is influenced by uh, a diverging perspective through its history by uh, the fact that sometimes it is allied with the might and power, and in other times it, uh, it was allied with a continental power. For example, um, during uh, the interwar era, the influence of German naval thinking and uh, eventually political, the political alliance with the fascist regime turned the uh, Italian inlook uh, into land, not in terms of uh, forecasted expansion, because, for example, the, uh, the fascist regime was directed toward maritime expansion, but to the approach to naval problems. So Italy faced the Second World War, which was largely a, a war with maritime needs, with a continental mentality. And in the end, this led to probably bad strategy and bad operational approach. Regarding the present, I think that probably Francesco is most suited to, to answer the question eventually about the nature of the current debate within Europe, uh, between the, the continental nature of the European system and the uh, Italian maritime necessity. So if he won't spend one word to turn that, uh, probably it would be, no, it will he's a little shy. <laughs> okay. To the so. first question, I, I, I just, uh, we, I would like to, to laugh a little bit saying two things. The first one, under the Vatican, we could be united before, or under the Venetian Empire as well, we could be united before. Mm. But the, no the Venetian, no the Vaticans were able to have the control of all the countries. So that was the, these probably were the only two states that could unite Italy before the Savoy. Oh, Genoa was no, never going to accept a unification led by Venetian. We have uh, Stefano that eventually can say something about the topic yes. of the questions. Uh, sure. Uh, actually, it was my fault because, as I said, I had to hurry up at the end of my talk. But uh, when I said that, um, uh, when I was saying that the growth of the military expenditure uh, in the first decade of the uh, new century uh, was made possible by a series of factors, um, I wonder. I, I wanted also, also to say, and I had to say, that um, it was the also the naval antagonism with the Austro-Hungarian Empire that became the focal point for naval culture, other than the main concern for the navy min, for the navy minister. So um, for sure, it was uh, central in the um, in the minister, and it was 
absolutely um, a pertinent question because actually it made possible with the improvement of economic conditions and with the effects of the socialist anti-navalist propaganda um, made possible the growth of the military expenditure. So yes, it had an influence, a real influence uh, during the, um, the two decades, the, the first decades of the 20th century, when there was this change, uh, this radical change in the, uh, in the military expenditure for the Navy. Thank you. I want to give an answer to the challenging question of Professor Fabio De Nino. And uh, I want uh, to remember the, th that in this uh, moment in Europe, we have a, a big problem. To, we must to decide uh, if uh, the Europe uh, must be in the future a maritime uh, power or a continentalist power. In this moment, uh, uh, it is important to underline uh, that there is a, a um, distinction between uh, the attention of the southern European countries to the sea and uh, the uh, attention of the central European and eastern European countries to the threat by Russia. In uh, our uh, perspective, according our perspective, it is very important to give attention to the threats and the, the challenges uh, from the south, in particular from the North Africa and from the Middle East, and the problem posed by the presence of China in the uh, Mediterranean. If we don't have any other question, I will summarize and move to the conclusion. No question. Okay. Uh, we we had a very interesting view of of, of this period, uh, as I told before, and uh, I will point it out some some subject quite interesting. The first one is the the maritime know-how. Uh, Leonardo pointed out this point, based on commercial and military dynamism by the Genoa Republic. The role of the character and density of population and their maritime professional professionalism. Uh, this, this is a very important point from, from all the people from Liguria. They have a very maritime attitude. They, they were able to expand at sea. The role of the inhabitants of Genova uh, that were a nation that moved away from the area they were born uh, to, to express their capability all over the world, not only in the Black Sea, but especially in the South America, in the Spanish colonies, in Spain, in Portugal. So uh, this is a very important uh, aspect of, of the Republic of Genoa, <coughs> very important. And, and we, we also, in, in the period of, of our, uh, the first years of our nation, uh, this memory was, was very present, very important. Guido. Uh, Guido pointed out in, in a very fantastic way the important role of, of, of three points, uh, uh, better four points. The artillery, personnel, and logistics, uh, together with the resources and, and money. Uh, money is really important uh, to, to build a fleet and uh, is the only possible way to um, create the capability to defend the bases overseas. Uh, naturally, economy um, is really paramount for a Navy. We, we, we never have to um, separate the importance of the fleet uh, from the naval fleet uh, from the merchant fleet. They are connected. From Stefano, it, it, it is very interesting. I was joking. I would say, no money, no ideas, no navy. So uh, without ideas, without money, we cannot have a navy. But uh, the role of Italy in the Mediterranean Sea was was quite important, and and we have to to, to remember the, the, the our uh, first job probably. Uh, he pointed out the, the defense of, of the coastline. Uh, 8,000 uh, 
kilometers from that we have to defend and control. Um, our uh, fleet, uh, uh, not only this point, uh, have, uh, have in mind, but uh, must consider the, um, the, the best way to protect the interest, the national interest, uh, uh, wherever the national interest is. And, and this start is in the very beginning of, of the country, and that is a very important point today. Um, so, uh, protection of the merchant fleet again, vulnerability of our coastline, but uh, a view to, uh, very far away from, from the country, from the Mediterranean, ready to, to uh, probably to accept this tradition that comes from Venice and, and Genova. Um, sempre Stefano, always Stefano, sorry, uh, I, I lost my English for a moment. Uh, fleet uh, in, in the beginning of the, of the country was uh, f uh, really fundamental for the uh, colonial expansion and economic development, uh, also industrial development. We, we have to remember that the heavy industry was, was created in Italy thanks to the Navy. Uh, fleet also has a, a prestige role for the country and uh, uh, absolutely important for the economic development. Uh, quality, uh, technical quality was another important point of this time. We create uh, one uh, class of, of, of ship, the video class, that was probably one of the best uh, ship uh, in the period. Another point that uh, nobody uh, touched, but uh, uh, it is very important, is that at the end of the century, our Navy was ready to fight. And this was uh, experience during the, um, the war against Turkey in 1911, just at the end of the period that Stefano uh, showed us. Francesco. The importance of naval law to f finance, uh, finance the Navy and the building of, of a Navy. Uh, the role uh, of, of Italian Navy close to the US and the other NATO Navy in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, the importance of the enlarged Mediterranean Sea, as we call it now, has a problem. We have to defend the Mediterranean, especially the Eastern Mediterranean, that is in, really in trouble. Contemporaneously, we have to be ready to go outside the Mediterranean. So we have to protect our area where we live, and contemporaneously, we have to be ready to radiate our power outside the Mediterranean, wherever it needs. It is important to, to, to bring. <clears throat> Um, ending with the final job of Fabio and, and, and really concluding this panel. Um, we talk about this uh, fight, the struggle between continentalism and uh, maritime attitude. This country, when was um, uh, completely devoted to the continental spirit and mentality uh, was uh, poor, uh, not so uh, acculturated, and not so free. When the view was toward the sea, we have a country that was rich, full of marvel marvelous architecture, marvelous poets and writers, marvelous paintings, and mainly a free country. And we, we can say this, uh, this is testified by, mainly by Genova and Venice. So if we look at the sea, we have uh, always to gain something. If we look continentally, we lose something. I think with these words, we can conclude our long presentation. 
thank you to Annapolis. All together, a clap. Ci sono, abbiamo capito un cacchio di quello che hanno detto. <ride>